Hi everybody, welcome back to Geezer Rider. This is our continuation and series on the dealership. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to remind you uh, to leave a comment if you're something you'd like to see added or more of or different. Uh, give it a thumbs up if you like the video, it's greatly appreciated. And by all means, please subscribe, hit that bell. Um, you'll get notifications when we put up uh, new videos. So this video is about why you would want to get your motorcycle maintenance done at the dealership. And other than the just overall divisiveness there is in general um, about the dealership one way or the other, uh, and we already covered, um, you know, the pros and cons of buying your motorcycle from the dealership. This issue of motorcycle maintenance at the dealership is probably one of the hot button issues um, that is getting talked about quite a bit these days. Apologize for the mic adjustment. Um, and the reason is there's a supposition that the, the dealership or the techs um, don't have your best interests at heart or they're not doing a good job or they're just way too expensive, what have you. So I want to tear that down a little bit. Um, I'm neither a shill for the dealership nor here to badmouth the dealership. I'm trying to give you enough information to make an informed decision. And again, we, we generally gear um, this information towards the novice or the person that's just not getting enough detail on a particular subject. Um, so we won't assume a high level of expertise and knowledge about either motorcycle maintenance, um, inspection, or putting on parts and accessories. So um, let's, let's just say that, you know, you're, you're new to the riding scene and you picked up your bike from motorcycle brand dealership X and it's time for your first oil change. And we'll just go on the assumption for a moment that it's not complimentary. Well, what could be simpler than an oil change, right? For gosh sake, you know, I, I change the oil in my car all the time, or, you know, I've watched a couple of videos. It doesn't seem too far off to me. Um, why, why wouldn't, why wouldn't I, or why shouldn't I do this myself? One, uh, I've mentioned it before, your time has value. Only you know how much that is. Um, so sometimes it just doesn't make sense to do it yourself. You know, you drop it off at the dealership, you go shopping for a while or pick it up the next day, or even if you wait for it, you know, maybe you can do a little, little work, um, while you're waiting for it in the waiting area, something like that, or, or browse the dealership while you're waiting for it. Um, the other reason is the warranty on the work and the warranty on the parts. So, you know, we just used the example of an oil change. If you, if you had an oil change at the dealer and you had an oil related failure, you had a warranty claim doing the work yourself. Um, there are laws in place and they're national that say, you know, doing your own oil change doesn't void the warranty, but it has to be documented and different manufacturers have different requirements for documenting the, um, the oil change. So generally what you need is a receipt for your oil and your oil or oils and your filter and any O-rings or gaskets or anything goes along with it on a dated receipt. And usually you can just write the mileage on the receipt um, that shows, you know, those items on there. And that's generally sufficient. Um, but you have to go through proving that you did that in a warranty claim situation. Um, obviously, you know, this is kind of a pessimistic view of, of things, but I'm giving you all the information you need. And the other thing is that some um, motorcycles actually have like torque specs for the drain plugs and stuff. And I can hear moaning and groaning now, oh, two grunts and you're good to go. You know, well, that's, that's not always necessarily true, right? There's something called crush tolerance for gaskets and O-rings where if they're over tightened, they're actually as likely to leak as if they're under tightened. So they may have a torque value and you are, you know, living alone in a, in a studio apartment with no storage space. You don't have anywhere to keep a, a wide variety of tools. Do you have hex keys and hex sockets? Do you have Allen keys and Alex Allen sockets? Do you have a torque wrench? Do you know how to use it? Is it at the right range? Um, yeah, I got a torque wrench. I use it on my car. Well, great. This isn't going to fit into every nook and cranny on your bike. Look at the area that's free around your swing arm and look at the area that's free around your engine compartment. Look online and see what bolts and nuts on your bike have a torque value and know that this might not 
fit in that tight space. Also, this is in foot pounds and newton meters. You might need inch pounds. Um, so then you get a smaller one. Okay, well, this is tinier. I'm likely to be able to get in here. Do I have um, quarter inch drive nuts and, and drivers that I can put on this that are going to fit my bike? And does this value go up high enough, um, lower than the the big torque wrench but um, higher than this you might need to go to a 3 8 inch drive so you can start to see how specialty tools might start to come into play that you may simply not want to invest in especially if they're for a particular type or year of bike or a particular model bike that you might not stay with for a long time you could wind up with a toolbox full of tools that are no longer used for servicing the bike that you own 15 years from now for example so that's something to think about um, the and and by the way the the torque wrench you generally want to use within 15 percent or 10 percent of either end of the range for a mechanical torque wrench digitals are a little bit good digital ones are a little bit nicer but you generally don't want to take this thing and oh it stops at 10 pounds well i'll just back off five clicks and that should be five pounds it's, it's not going to be guaranteed to be accurate that way also there are a lot of things that a mechanic knows or somebody who's been doing things a long time knows that might not be self-evident aka the torque wrench for example if you have a bolt that's recessed and you have to use an extension the value you set for the torque on here is no longer accurate you have to put a loss factor in for the um, extension uh, of about an, a pound or two of torque because there's some slop in that extension. And while you know most torque values are a range from one to the other, if you're a person that says, well, I'll put less torque on it because that's less wear and tear and I think I'm gonna be doing this particular item over and over again, you, and you put it at the minimum value on your torque wrench and use an extension, you could actually under torque by a couple of foot pounds, for example. Um, and that, that's something that's just not always self-evident. And that's a, a, a particular bullet point. That's an item that's not always shared in these, these maintenance videos, right? They're assuming a certain amount of expertise or sometimes a person that's making the video is well-intentioned. They just don't know themselves. Um, and yeah, that's really nitpicky, right? <laughs> I mean, we're talking about a couple of foot pounds, but you don't know what you don't know. So the dealer, you know, the, they have factory trained technicians or they have technicians that have been through some kind of, you know, motorcycle um, school like the automotive, I think ASE equivalent, you know, motorcycle type school. And then they have training from the factory as well. Um, I've mentioned a couple times I used Harley Davidson just for illustrative purposes because that's what I have right now and that's top of mind and I can, you know, illuminate a particular item. So I will use that right now. So modern Harley Davidson's have a proprietary um, computer system. I mean, they use a CAN bus. If you don't know what CAN bus is, just Google it. It's like OBD in your car. Um, and that's the computer, that's the brains of the operation. And Harley has something referred to as digital technician, where they can get codes out of the computer for faults, like a bad oxygen sensor, often referred to as an O2 sensor. Um, you know, if the gas cap is loose, if the emissions are off. And they can also adjust things regarding your stereo system. For example, if you have a, a you know, a tour bike or a bike with, with a factory uh, stereo system on it. That's something you don't have that they have and they have all the specialty tools they have a lift they can get the thing in the air they can see things that you don't have um, things like maintaining your belt or chain tension and rear wheel alignment yes it can be done um, on your own um, you're going to need a torque wrench <laughs> as, as an example of specialty tools and it's not something you want to get wrong there's something called thrust angle that's important and greatly affects handling and tire wear and also braking efficiency so there is a safety issue there's an outlay of tools cost issue there's knowing what to use and the value of your time so when you when you go to the dealership and they give you an estimate for some kind of work um, they're using approved fluids they're using approved fasteners they're using um, the right tools for the job so that things are tightened and or adjusted properly and you have a guarantee for the work should you have an issue later that you've got one throat to choke and it's not your own you get to go back to them and say hey you know 
you've got 30 day warranty on the work. It's 27 days ago I had this work done here. I think this is related to that work and something's not right. A reputable dealer, and we talked about establishing the relationship with your dealer in, in the first video, the overview of the manufacturer's dealership. So if you have that relationship, you should be able to go in there and have a conversation, not yell at people, you know, but go in there and have a conversation. Yes, it's inconvenient, but this is nothing you're, you haven't dealt with with a, with a car, right? Going to a car dealership or an independent mechanic. Sometimes the replacement sells them replacement parts themselves are faulty. That happens. There's something called high infant mortality. If you are an actuary or you're somebody that does reliability studies, you know about this. So there's three, three ranges of um, failure modes for any replacement part or original part. There's high infant mortality where it dies almost immediately. There's middle of the road where it doesn't meet its expected time uh, hours of operation or mileage in use. And then there's um, the replacement lifespan where usually they will say, hey, this needs to be replaced X amount of time, engine running hours or miles before it becomes a critical failure point, especially if it's a safety item. So that's the other thing. They're going to do an inspection of the bike and they're going to say, hey, you've got 30% left on your brake pads. And everybody goes, well, that's ridiculous. I can still ride around with 30%. Yeah, that's right. You know, so you brought the bike back in the fall and you had 30% left on your brake pads and they don't know how aggressively you ride or not. You know, they can get an idea from, you know, if the brake pads have ever been replaced before in the year of the bike, but you know, you, you put the bike away for the winter. If you're somebody that doesn't drive all year round and you pull the bike out in the spring and you go for all your rides, suddenly you're down to 10% of your um, brake pad life before the end of the season. That's, that's marginal. You know, you really don't want to stay there. Um, there's a variety of things that could cause them to, to wear a little bit quicker. Um, and you have uh, heat transfer that builds up as the backing plate gets closer to the road or there's, there's a lot of physics um, going on there. Again, we're talking about percentages of, of a percent in, in some cases, but these are things that the dealer knows. And yes, they are out to sell you goods and services. That's their job. That's why they exist, but not always to your detriment and their benefit. They want to keep you safe. They want you to come back and buy another bike. They want you to come back and get more service. They want you to come back and buy more parts and or accessories. It is in their best interest to treat you well, right? Um, that's, that's just a good business model. And what I tell people mostly is, you know, especially those that are just convinced that all dealerships are evil. I say, well, then do what I do anytime I'm shopping for anything, goods or services. Vote with your dollars. Create your personal blacklist if that's going to, you know, be the way you remember things. And if you have a negative experience that you don't think can be overcome, um, either because the, the other party just won't negotiate or remediate or remedy the situation or the way they went about it just didn't agree with you. Right. You know, they just had a really bad attitude and Hey, this is, you know, a ride. This is my Zen. I want it to be nice. Right. I want it to be a good time. It shouldn't always be a hassle. But with your dollars, just simply find another dealership. You know, um, I know some people are in really rural areas and it's a, a long haul and a hassle just to get to the one that's closest to them. I hope that you have a good experience with them. Um, you know, what I will say in those particular uh, instances is that you often will receive a survey. The one from the dealership maybe only goes so far, they'll turn in the good stuff to get their kudos from the manufacturer. But the ones that come from the manufacturer, those programs are monitored. Those programs are addressed. And if you have an issue that you can, you can substantiate, you can say, this is exactly what happened. And I don't feel I was wrong. You can see here I was wrong. Um, you can affect a change for that dealership. And the dealership, the back office should recognize that that's an opportunity for them to improve and do better and ultimately help themselves, right? If you, if you get a back office that doesn't realize that you um, calmly and clearly and logically explaining the situation uh, isn't going to help them in the long term, again, that's some, somebody you probably don't want to deal with anymore. I found in general, most dealerships are pretty darn good. You know, if you go in there with a chip on your shoulder, you know, people are human. You're going to feed off each other. You know, if you, if you just start off all negative, um, 
and occasionally you're going to get a bad part or you're going to get bad service. There'll be, you know, a, a bad tech that happens, but tell me any service industry or any retail industry where that doesn't happen from time to time. How do you handle that? You know, do you go online? Do you go on Yelp? Do you, you know, shout from the highest treetop? And do you just say, I'm excluding all these people? You know, just put it in context. Um, it is more painful. It's, it's a little more emotional because for most people, riding is a luxury. Um, sometimes, you know, the bike is the bike and the, the motorcycle is considered a toy. You know, it's your former relaxation. Relaxation for some people, it's their only relaxation. I like to refer to it as my reset button. I go for a ride and I, and I get more chill um, as a result of it. Uh, that's just my personal experience. So when something inhibits my ability to do that, yeah, that, that's that's kind of a bummer. And there's different ways that I can react to that. So, you, you know, try and try and put any problem you may have in context and think about the benefits that might be there for you if you go to a motorcycle manufacturer's dealership. Um, they... <clears throat> The specialty tools, you know, that's not something to be taken lightly. You can buy inexpensive specialty tools that are even the single use ones I've had. We all know the type of place that I'm talking about. You know, it's, it's imported. Not that everything imported is bad, but, you know, some of the imported tools are you know, screwdrivers snap the first time you use them. You know, you, you go to use a hex key and put any kind of torque on it and thing gets a helical twist in it. Not because you're being overzealous with it, but just because it's of poor quality. And using poor quality tools on your bike is no bueno. You want to make sure that you use good quality tools so you get a good result. Think about what's at stake here. It's you, the bike, and the pavement. It can't be any plainer than that. You know, so having the bike safe and in good running order is not a wish list. It is a must do. Um, so the manufacturer's service department, you know, the dealership service department also knows the service intervals that, uh, you know, a shade tree mechanic might not know or just might not want to perform. You know, steering head bearings, depending on what kind of um, bike this is. So the where the handlebars come down to um, the front end of your bike, that's called a triple tree. And there's that tubular thing in the middle. And at the top is a set of bearings and the bottom is a set of bearings, depending on how the bike is built. But in general, that's, that's what's going on. Those st steering head bearings have to be lubricated and adjusted at periodic intervals, and usually at least once after the bike is new. So that's another reason you want to go to the dealer, you know, get that done. A lot of times that's complimentary. Um, you can build up, you know, there's reward and loyalty programs at the dealership. You know, if you spend X amount of money in services, we do something for you or we give you something, you won't know unless you inquire. Um, and I think I mentioned before in one of the other videos, the last thing you want to do is be reassembling your bike or completing maintenance on your bike the day before or hours before you're about to leave on a trip long distance, you know, you need to do a thorough test drive in an area where you have great familiarity and you can somehow get the bike back to home base uh, after any kind of accessory ad or um, mechanical maintenance of any kind or you know any any work that you do on the bike uh, you need to know if you have an electrical issue you need to know if you have a mechanical issue um, safety issue, if you've obscured your visibility, if something in the instrument cluster is no longer working, um, in your hurry to get this done and get finished that packing that you've been putting off for the trip, you might overlook these things. And that is just a recipe for disaster. Taking it to the dealer means that you know, they've got skin in the game. If something goes wrong, you can take it to another dealer that has reciprocity. Most of the manufacturers have some kind of reciprocal um, arrangement where they will honor the work done by another dealership. And that's a discussion you should have with the service department before you get service. 
Um, and then if you're out on the trip and something happens, it can be taken care of. And, you know, obviously you've got to ride the bike back from the dealer unless you're trailering it. So you've got your test ride in. Um, obviously that could be resolved by planning well ahead in doing work yourself. But if you find yourself in a pinch point where there was just something you forgot to do, then so be it. Um, and just doing the job neat and tidy. There's a variety of funnels and things. And, you know, the dealership generally has like um, lined cloth bags to put your fenders in or your seat or your fairing or your windshield to protect while um, you're working on the bike. And you're not cluttering up your garage bay or parking spot, you know, while the bike's torn apart if you need to wait for a part. And that's an, another thing. The dealership doesn't always have every part in stock that they need to do the work on your bike. But they're probably more likely to have it than you are. And even with today's, um, you know, quick quick turnaround time on, on delivery, you're still talking about at least waiting an overnight if you haven't already figured out that you need a part or a gasket or an O-ring or a seal or whatever it may be. So that's, that's another advantage to the dealership. So I hope this has given you a, an, an idea of a couple of things. One, how you might not be equipped um, as far as tools are concerned to perform the maintenance on your own. And also that the knowledge and the skills might not always be there for every job. And you want to be 100% sure that you know what you're doing um, anytime you work on your bike for, this, for the safety concerns we mentioned earlier. Um, again, you don't know what you don't know. And not every video you're going to watch or tutorial or, you know, book or instruction manual is really going to have all the information um, that you need. You know, I've seen some pretty glaring, overs glaring oversights over the years, which just, you know, left me scratching my head. Like, how are they even getting away with this? <laughs> um, you know, or, or why would they purport to know something about this um, when they're leaving out such big items? Um, and then and that's the other thing is, you know, you're, you're like, okay, well, great. You know, you're, you're, you're dinging me for not having skills. How am I going to get skills if I don't do the work? Valid point. At some point you're going to have to do some of the work. So, you know, start off with a thing that is going to be the most common maintenance that you're going to do on your bike. And that is an oil change. And that varies from motorcycle to motorcycle. Some have wet clutch, some have dry clutch, some require additives, some have, you know, just oil and it's a shared crankcase. Others have, you know, oil and they have uh, transmission fluid. On the Harley, there's something affectionately referred to as a three-hole oil change. Um, that's not a derogatory term, it's literal. There's actually three different areas of um, fluid that need to be checked and changed at particular intervals. Um, it can be a messy job and there's particular special little plastic um, funnels and fillers and thing that help make the job easier and neater. It's not that you can't do it without them, but that it just makes your life a little bit easier. So figure out for your bike what's needed. Get when, when it's out of warranty and you're out of complimentary oil changes and everything, you know, and you may develop such a great relationship with the service department, they'll, they'll let you watch an oil change. I don't know, some, some um, departments won't even let you in the back for insurance reasons, et cetera. And some of the others are like, yeah, come on back, you know, because they know if you're not bringing it in for an oil change, you're bringing it in for something else. And if they're smart, they'll tell you something that's valid. You know, don't forget to come in and get the thing checked out from time to time for us to find the things that you've overlooked. And as they point out things that you've overlooked, you'll know to look for that the next time you do an oil change and you'll slowly build up your skill sets over time if you choose to work on the bike yourself. Um, we'll do another video about third-party maintenance uh, along with the third-party purchase of the motorcycle and purchase of parts and accessories. But for now, you know, we're just talking about the dealership and um, getting your work done there. So the downside of having the work done at the dealership if you already have the tools if you already have the knowledge and you already have the time is the cost the cost is generally not insignificant and we and the overview for 
um, the motorcycle dealership in general, we, we talked about their overhead and, you know, the fact that they are not the evil empire. What they are is a business that's trying to make money and pay their employees and, you know, give them dental and health care and everything, just like any other business. Um, they're not trying to turn you upside down and empty your pockets in your wallet. They're just trying to get the job done the right way, which costs a little money and, you know, pay for the work, pay for the people and pay for the parts and everything. So, you know, yeah, I can go online and buy some oil that doesn't have the factory logo on it for a buck less a quart or two bucks less a quart or whatever it is, or the oil filter or whatever. Um, but we already addressed why you might want to use, um, their items and why even acquiring that stuff, uh, there's certain circumstances where, you know, you could be putting yourself in harm's way if you don't document everything you do uh, or you don't, um, you lose that documentation later on and you need it for, you know, a claim of some kind. Um, the other thing is kind of making a positive out of negative recalls, right? So, yeah, you can generally go on to uh, NHTSA and National Highway Safety Transportation Administration, NHSTA. Um, and find active recall campaigns where they've been told to publish this is you know something recall it has to come in for work or parts replacement if you go to the dealership they have sometimes gray recalls where um, they'll proactively do something or at least they'll put you on a list and say hey you know we haven't come up with a solution for this yet but we're going to let you know and you know it'll become a full-blown recall later on or maybe it's just a, a good graces thing where they just so happen to uh, you know take care of it but you know they know all those campaigns both past and present and forthcoming and when they get your bike they're going to go over everything yeah, you can probably go out there and gather all that information on your own time and figure out what has and hasn't been done to your bike. Maybe, maybe not. Um, but, you know, the, the dealership can, can figure that out for you. So that's another reason. And, then, and all that generally comes back to safety and reliability. You don't want to break down. You want to get where you're going. You don't want to have worries. You don't want, you know, a gray cloud hanging over your head. You know, I wonder if that thing that I haven't done for, you know, it's 10,000 miles past when it was supposed to be done. I wonder when that's going to jump up and bite me. Um, so you want it to be safe. You want it to be reliable. Again, I hope that this has given you an overview um, that's pretty impartial, you know, down the middle of the road. Not so I can tell you to do one thing or the other, you know, to always do your own maintenance or to always go to the dealership, but to give you enough information to make an informed decision on your own. And that decision may change from time to time, depending on where you are with your knowledge, where you are with your tools, where you are with your money and where you are in life and what bike you have, you know? Um, so once again, ride safe. Namaste.